Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I'm doing a bit of a donation drive. As you know, I do all these podcasts full-time. The writing, the research, everything. And it's a lot of work, but I love it. But I thought I'm going to give a donation drive a try just to bring in some extra money to pay the bills, to put food in my belly, and to put food in the belly of my dog. Of course, if you don't donate, that's okay too. The fact you listen means the world to me, and I really do appreciate it. If you would like to donate, just go to CanadaEHX.com and click Donate. You can donate any amount. I'll make sure I give you a thank you on the air and throughout my social media, as well as at the end of the month. If you like, you can email me at craig at CanadaEHX.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. During the 19th century, Canadians liked to drink, maybe even more so than today. In an Upper Canada census in 1851, it was found there were 1,999 taverns, which amounted to one tavern for every 478 people. As such, issues such as domestic abuse, drunkenness, and the poverty related to it was rampant. As with the United States, the temperance movement began to gain steam, believing that banning alcohol would end those troubles and bring better days for everyone. Of course, the problems were much more complex than that, but at the time it seemed like a good solution. While Canadians would enact national prohibition by order of council on April 1, 1918, the ban only lasted one year. In the provinces, though, prohibition bans would come into effect in various years and last for a much longer period of time. The first place in Canada after Confederation to enact prohibition was the Northwest Territories in 1874, and it would remain in place until 1891. For most of Canada, from British Columbia to Nova Scotia, prohibition was enacted in succeeding waves from 1916 to 1921, and most of these would only remain in place for five to seven years. In Quebec, it lasted less than one year. Then, there was Prince Edward Island. Beginning in 1901, the province would enact prohibition, and while the rest of the country would follow years later and repeal it soon after, Prince Edward Island doubled down. The last major province to repeal prohibition was Nova Scotia, which had it in place for nine years from 1921 to 1930. Prince Edward Island would do the same, nearly two decades after that. It was not until 1948 that the province finally repealed prohibition. Today I'm looking at the nearly half century of prohibition in Prince Edward Island. In 1878, the Canada Temperance Act, also known as the Scott Act, provided a national framework for municipalities to opt in by vote to a scheme of prohibition without making the entire country dry. Several counties in 1879 in New Brunswick would use the act to ban alcohol, while various other counties and other provinces would do the same between 1880 and 1915. The law would actually remain on the books until it was finally repealed in 1984. In 1898, Canada had looked at introducing prohibition, and while it featured widespread support across Canada, it was overwhelmingly opposed in Quebec. As such, the country did not implement it at the time, but that would spawn the movement in Prince Edward Island to implement its own serious temperance effort soon after. By 1899, the temperance laws on the island were actually pretty radical by most standards and had been in place for a decade by that point. The law stated, quote, Any person who shall give any person any liquor in any tavern or place where liquor is sold shall be guilty of an offence against the Act and liable, on summary convictions before the magistrate, to a penalty of no less than $2 and no more than $5. End quote. In addition to the fine, which would amount to $65 to $165 today, those found guilty could end up spending between 10 to 25 days in jail. The hours in which liquor could be sold was also heavily limited. All bars had to close on Saturdays by 6 p.m. and stay closed until 8 a.m. on Monday. Bars were also closed every Dominion and Provincial holiday, and the only place where liquor was sold on Tuesdays or Fridays after 7 p.m. was Charlottetown. The importation of liquor was heavily taxed as well, as much as $50 to $100, while breweries were taxed a staggering $400. Any traveler coming to the province was required to pay $20, but if you were there traveling for liquor houses, you paid $200. And for most people, the only place to get any alcohol was in Charlottetown. As a result of this, Prince Edward Island actually had a very low instance of alcohol consumption. 
Of all the provinces at the time, each person drank an average of half a gallon of liquor per year, well below the national average of 4 gallons and far below British Columbia at 8.75 gallons. Of the offenses that would be linked to alcohol, there was only a 0.12 per 1,000 people rate, compared to 1.56 per 1,000 people in British Columbia and 0.63 per 1,000 people in Canada as a whole. Even as Canada continued to debate a temperance law in 1900, one Liberal MP from the province stated that if such a law was asked for and passed, it could be tried in Prince Edward Island and the rest of the country would watch the experiment in that province and see how it worked. By the time 1901 rolled around, nearly every place in Prince Edward Island except Charlottetown prohibited the sale of alcohol. The problem was that people would just go to Charlottetown to get alcohol and then go home elsewhere. The provincial government attempted to pass a license act, but the counties would not agree to this, and the opposition was enough that it would bring down the government. At the same time, Charlottetown would not enact prohibition. The province would solve the problem by passing its own Prohibition Act, which passed unanimously and covered the entire province. And it's not surprising that the act passed considering the Premier had abstained from alcohol his entire life. In June of that year, Prohibition went into effect in the province, but the law was not perfect in keeping liquor out of the province. There was nothing stopping people from buying liquor wholesale or alcohol for medicinal purposes. What the Prohibition law would put into force was the banning of the retail trade of alcohol and the opportunities to indulge in it. The penalties under the new Prohibition law were severe as well. The first offence was $100, or about $3,500 today. A second offence would cost a person $200, and a third offence would be much harsher, with six months in jail with no option of making a monetary payment. The Montreal Gazette would report, quote, The government of the province, it is claimed, is sincere in its intention to enforce the law. So much depends on local feelings in such matters, however that good intentions at headquarters are only one element in the conditions that ensure success. End quote. Once the law went into effect, it did not stop liquor dealers from continuing to apply their trade. The Regina Leader Post reported, quote, Prohibition went into force in Prince Edward Island last Wednesday week. Quite a number of liquor men continued to sell and the Premier stated that an attempt would be made to enforce the law. End quote. Saloons openly violated the law as well in the province, but their time was limited. By July, of the 30 liquor sellers in the province, 75% were out of business and the remaining liquor sellers were committed and were appealing the charges levied against them under the law. The liquor sellers were quoted as saying, quote, The liquor sellers attempted to drive through the law by declaring what they sold was only beer. Whiskey or brandy or such liquors were taken as intoxicants, but beer was not necessarily so. Yet if a man would come forward and state that he had drunk beer at a certain saloon and had become inebriated, the seller of that beer would be prosecuted. End quote. By December, reports of heavy fines were reaching newspapers. On December 16th, the Charlottetown police imposed fines of $4 on three men charged with being drunk, while one man was fined $100 and one was fined $200 for selling liquor. Over the next month, liquor continued to be a serious problem, and at least four serious crimes, including two that resulted in murder, would occur and were traced to drinking local establishments. The Vancouver Daily World would state, quote, so far, prohibition, so-called, seems to have been a saddening failure as a preventative of liquor selling and drinking in Prince Edward Island. End quote. The issue over the law would reach the Prince Edward Island Supreme Court by January 1902. The court would declare that provincial prohibition was constitutional, but would not state how the legislation would be made more practical and effective in operation. The enforcement of prohibition fell on the chief inspector and various other inspectors who worked under him. These inspectors had broad powers to arrest and search people they suspected of selling liquor. The job was not easy and it was noted there was a high turnover rate among the inspectors. In 1918, a major change would come to the Prohibition Act when it was almost completely rewritten. The new act created a six-member board of commissioners who were appointed for a three-year term by the lieutenant governor. This commission, usually made up of clergy, was given the power to license one wholesale vendor and as many retail vendors as was deemed necessary. These retail vendors replaced the druggists and pharmacists who had filled the role for the past 17 years. The retail vendors could sell to any person who presented a prescription of 24 ounces of wine or spirits and 12 quarts of ale no more than once a day. If the person lived more than 10 miles from the vendor, that amount could be doubled. Now we're going to take a brief break from the podcast because I'm going to talk about a podcast that I really enjoy. I've been a fan of it for over a year now, and it's called Obscure History. 
It's a wonderful podcast. It's available on all podcast platforms, and it delves into the really interesting and really obscure history that I find so fascinating. Did you know that Eric Von Daniken, the man who popularized ancient alien theory, was a lifelong con man and that the person who edited his book Chariot of the Gods was an actual Nazi? How about this? Did you know that Edgar Booth, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, actually saved one of Abraham Lincoln's children from being killed in a train accident? Have you ever wondered what amazing tales are just hiding away in hundred-year-old newspapers waiting to be discovered? Well then, I have a show for you. My name is Josh, and Obscure History is available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, as with doctors and druggists, it did not take long for people to find a way to work around the system, and with sympathetic retail vendors, it was possible to get plenty of alcohol. To combat this, only one year later in 1919, a script system was introduced. These scripts were pre-printed prescriptions that were supplied by the Commission to Physicians. Each of the scripts was serial numbered, and this would allow the Commission to control how many prescriptions were handed out. In 1928, the six-member commission was abolished and a new commission, appointed by the lieutenant governor and consisting of a chairman and two members, was established. As America would find out when it implemented prohibition, if you stop people from getting something easily, they will find another way to get it and pay handsomely for it. In Charlottetown, Summerside, and Albertown, it was possible to pay $1 for a doctor's script and $4 for a bottle of brandy. Bottles of beer for a case of 12 would cost $20 to $25, amounting to over $300 today. As the 1930s began and the Great Depression took hold, one thriving business that could pay the bills was rum running. With the Great Depression, the price of crops sank, and for an island where potatoes were the cash crop, making only 10 cents a bushel was not going to cut it. Tommy Gallant would tell of his father who had a thriving rum running business. He would stay, quote, My father bootlegged. He'd done all the things in them days that he thought he was going to make some money. We started to grow up as young fellows, so we thought we would sample it, and we did, because we could steal it from our father quite easy, because he had hid it everywhere. End quote. Gallant's father would hide the alcohol in the woods or sink it in New London Bay using scrap steel. Gallant would say, quote, On his way home, with a load of rum, 10-gallon kegs, he would run a long line, and he'd put all of the steel on it and tie the kegs to it. Of course, it would go all the way to the bottom, and then he had a great landmark. And at night, he'd take out the dory, and he'd pull up one end, and he'd take a keg ashore. End quote. Rum runners would also hide alcohol in barrels, filled with salt and fish, or even put the alcohol under furrows in a plowed field. One man, who grew up at the time, stated that at least two churches were used as hiding places for rum and alcohol. The police would always try to catch the rum runners, but they had plenty of tricks up their sleeves to prevent that. This included landing with rum when everyone's attention was diverted simply by paying someone to make a commotion so that the rum runners could get their illegal alcohol ashore. Rum runners would also steal from each other as well, with the business and alcohol being so lucrative. Possibly the most famous bootlegger of the type was Edward Dix, who sailed the Nellie J. Banks to several rum-running adventures. The ship had been built in 1910 and was launched that same year, But it was in 1926 that Ray Clark and Captain Dix bought the ship for $2,000, seeing that it was the perfect vessel to smuggle alcohol in. One year later, in July of 1927, she was seized by the Coast Guard ship Bayfield. When he was arrested, Captain Dix accused the Canadian government of piracy for taking his cargo, stating he would proceed against the government in the matter. He would say, quote, I am not a lawbreaker. I am a legitimate business. They call me a smuggler. That is wrong. I am a rum runner. End quote. The Bayfield didn't just seize the Nellie J. Banks, though. She also seized three other ships, including the Stella R, which was loaded with 3,300 gallons of distilled liquor. The Nellie was loaded with 900 cases of liquor. After this small setback, the ship and its crew went right back to smuggling alcohol into the island. The practice, of course, was highly profitable. The Prince Edward Island government was committed to stopping ships from rum running in alcohol, In 1926, only $65.26 worth of alcohol was brought in, putting the government in the red in the matter. One year later, though, the government had seized $30,000 in liquor. 
One story from 1927 states that the ship would never come within 10 kilometers of the coast, and on one occasion had a cargo of 2,000 gallons of rum, which was hidden in the water and which made the captain and the crew $1,500 for one trip, equivalent to $23,700 today. Rum running would typically only happen from the spring to the summer, due to the freezing of the water around Prince Edward Island making it harder to get alcohol to the island. In the winter of 1930, for example, only 20.5 gallons of rum were reported to have been seized. In contrast, during the iceless seasons of 1929, 1,186.75 gallons of rum was seized. While the government did what it could, it was estimated that while the province had a population of 100,000 people, more than 72,000 gallons of liquor was making its way into the province, and only a small portion of that was being seized. One rum running operation sold $142,000 worth of alcohol in one year alone, making $2.8 million on the process, nearly all of it going to doctors who sold it for medicinal purposes. And when I say medicinal, I use quotes. As one man would say, quote, Prohibition is an impossible thing. The text of a law will never stop people from drinking. End quote. In 1935, a $5 million smuggling ring amounting to nearly $100 million today was broken up by the police. The ring consisted of nine Nova Scotia men and two Prince Edward Island men, and another 20 people were cited as conspirators. Eventually, new regulations were put in place that would allow Canadian officials to board and seize any vessel with a British registry under 500 tons within 15 kilometers of the coast, where previously that rule only extended out 5 kilometers, which allowed the Nellie J. Banks to remain outside the zone. In August of 1938, the Nellie was finally seized by the RCMP cutter Ulna and towed into Charlottetown. When caught, the ship was loaded with 225 cases of alcohol, 50 kegs of rum, 20 cases of gin, 24 cases of whiskey, and 20,000 cigarettes. By the end of the Second World War, the first signs of prohibition would finally be leaving the province emerged. It was in that year that an amendment was made to the act that allowed a physician to once again prescribe 26 ounces of spirits, 104 ounces of wine, and 9 quarts of ale to be delivered weekly for six months to a patient if it was deemed beneficial to their health. Once the patient had the prescription, they would exchange it for a warrant which had coupons within it and could be redeemed weekly. The change in 1945 was seen by most as something without substance with the government selling liquor for beverage purposes under the disguise of medicinal purposes. At the time, it was estimated that per capita the citizens of Prince Edward Island drank as much as the citizens of Ontario. The Temperance Act was introduced in 1948 that would repeal the original Prohibition Act and create a government liquor control system, much like it had been seen in other provinces for decades by that point. The new act would allow residents to get a permit to purchase alcohol, while tourists had a special permit. The amount a person could buy at one time did not change from the previous amendment in 1945, and the sale of liquor was allowed in messes, canteens, legion branches, and non-profit clubs. A pamphlet put out by the government would state, quote, The New Temperance Act is directed at the sin or crime of intemperance in such a way that an intemperate person may not obtain liquor. End quote. Under the proposal, if any wife or friend of any person complained that the person was wasting money on alcohol, a justice of the peace would revoke the liquor permit of that person. Anyone who supplied liquor to someone who had their permit revoked was also liable to be sent to jail with no option to pay a fine. There have been several plebiscites over the previous four decades asking if people wanted to get rid of prohibition, and each time the province voted in favour of staying dry. In 1929, 17,000 electors cast their ballot, with a majority of 218 people choosing to have the government continue with prohibition. As such, most expected the new vote would yield the same result. On June 28, 1948, a plebiscite was held, and the residents of Prince Edward Island voted in favour of a new act, and on July 6 of that year, the sale of liquor for beverage purposes was once again legal. Among Prince Edward Island residents, there was 19,814 votes for the repealing of Prohibition, while 7,338 votes in favour of keeping Prohibition, while the turnout was about 60%. The Ottawa Journal would report, quote, Now obviously they do not want Prohibition, and the decent thing was the course they followed of discarding a very transparent umbrella which has failed to hide the fact that our smallest province consumes about as much alcohol per head of the population of our largest province. End quote. This would be the first time since 1878 that the province voted down prohibition. Many were surprised by the overwhelming victory, which they'd at least expected to be close. 
there would be continued changes to the act over the next 20 years. In 1952, an amendment allowed for the purchase of four weekly rations to be bought at one time, and in 1960, all quantity restrictions were removed from the act. In 1961, the Temperance Act was renamed the Liquor Control Act, and the Temperance Commission became the Liquor Control Commission. In 1964, regular liquor licensing was enacted in the province, allowing for nightclubs and lounges to sell liquor. In 1967, after 68 years, another amendment was put into place when tourists and individual permits were abolished. Until well into the 1980s, it remained illegal to have any pubs or taverns in Prince Edward Island, and this would result in homes being set up as taverns, which was a new form of bootlegging in the province and one that could result in some stiff fines, but most police and authorities took a very relaxed approach towards it. Bootleggers are not terribly hard to find in Charlottetown. There are the subtle hints, like picture windows with smoked glass, and the not-so-subtle hints, like the truck picking up empties the morning after the night before. Police say there are about 25 bootleggers in this city of 16,000. Bootlegging's been a part of our island culture for literally centuries. It's all fairly open, but usually you don't get in unless the bootlegger knows you. There's takeout service, but on Prince Edward Island, it's more common to drink in. This is Gordy Dunn's place. He had to move his operation here recently, after police raided his old place just two doors away. A judge ordered it shut down for a year, just after Gordy had renovated. I added this addition on out here and put in a pool table, which, which went over very well. Gordy Dunn says he pays taxes on his bootleg income that most in Charlottetown know what he does and regard him as just another small businessman trying to carry on a family tradition. Well, my own family, we've been bootlegging this town for 75 years. My grandmother, my grandfather, and then it moved on to my mother and father, and then on to myself. And it's a, it's a way of life. Bootlegging is a way of island life because for the longest time you couldn't get a drink here illegally. Prohibition wasn't abolished until the early 1950s, and up until 1964, you needed a permit to get your weekly limit of a quart of liquor and a case of beer. Things have loosened up a bit since then. There are now nightclubs and lounges in the province, but the island's liquor law still does not allow pubs or taverns. That's why the bootlegger's house remains the neighborhood tavern. People just like drinking at bootleggers because at every different bootleggers is a certain group of people and that's your friends usually your working buddies or whatever and they're there there have been periodic police raids over the years but for the most part the authorities have taken a fairly tolerant approach to this island tradition not to uh, defend the activity itself but uh, they do not uh, they don't hurt anybody However, there are signs of a building bootleg backlash. Complaints from these homeowners about their neighborhood bootlegger prompted a recent police raid and promises from the Justice Minister to review the law dealing with such establishments. Gordy Dunn's not worried, though. I think law is here. He says traditions on his side. Kevin Evans, CBC News, Charlottetown. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the Prince Edward Island Years of Prohibition. Next week, we're looking at the Great St. John Fire. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Canadian Encyclopedia, The Ottawa Journal, Wikipedia, Montreal Gazette, The Regina Leader Post, The Vancouver Province, The Vancouver Daily World, The Winnipeg Tribune, Liquor PEI, The Ottawa Citizen, CBC, and Discover Charlottetown. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.